Welcome to the online conference where our experts will be covering the different challenges airlines face with online payments. My name is Layla Schwartz McRae and I am responsible for marketing and communications in the Americas region. Before we jump into this topic, I'd like to cover some housekeeping notes. First things first is our Skype call is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Lufthansa Systems website after this session. Your, you as participants are muted by default and that is to eliminate any background noise through the presentation. Also, the online polling uh, for that tool, we'll be using the Skype function and that tool does not um, um, how you say, store or process any personal data. And for the Q&A, the Q&A session will be taking place at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat box and we will address that at the end of the conference. So with that covered, I would like to hand over to Christian Cabanis, who is moderating this conference today. Enjoy. Well, Lala, thanks very much for that introduction. I'm Christian Cabanis and I welcome, welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, very much to our 12th online conference. Let's talk about IT. This time we will be covering challenges the airline face with their online payments. As I said, my name is Christian Cabanis and uh, I'm the PCI Compliance Officer of Lufthansa Systems, taking care that every year we get our PCI certificate. I'm with Lufthansa since about 25 years working in the fields of finance, mainly controlling and accounting. To talk about the payment challenges, we have brought along two very interesting experts with whom we will discuss the payment ecosystem and to dive deeper into the payment uh, process and its various challenges. We will outline some options how to can, we can unlock your payment system potentials and get a glimpse of what is possible, possible future looks like. So the first one, we have Tim Brickman, who is the product owner of the Payment Hub and the PCI engine. And um, he is working in this field since about 10 years, and he's also the creator of the PCI engine and has lots of experience within the Lufthansa group relating to payments. The second one is John Adadevi. He grew up with Cyax revenue counting or revenue counting topics, and sometimes I have the impression he's nurtured with revenue counting since he always talks about this and is uh, very knowledgeable about these topics with revenue counting and also payment related. Uh, he's also the creative head of the product Smart Ledger, and if he doesn't take care of on Smart Ledger and revenue counting, he's a vivid sales executive traveling through the world, and I sometimes have the impression that he spends more time in the aircraft than at home. Well, to get everybody um, on the same page for the online payment conference, I'd like to show you a high-level payment process, how we understand it. Here you see on the slide the general process of what is um, uh, simplification of the process, there's much more behind. On the left hand side, you have the buyer who enters his payment card credentials in, into the website of an airline or the merchant when he wants to purchase a ticket or wants to pay for, a, let's say, an upgrade at the counter or whether he wants to pay something via call center or during the in flight uh, process. The um, airline forwards this information to the payment gateway or the payment service provider, depending on how your system has been set up. The payment provider or the payment gateway forwards this information to the acquirer who confirms whether there are enough funds to cover the purchase. All this information travels back to the airline. The airline issues then the PNR and the ticket or uh, gives uh, hands over the product to the to the customer and informs them 
about the successful purchase. Well, what we have experienced as a Lufthansa, there are um, several objectives in this process. There are many challenges like fraud and whatsoever, their costs and their revenues for the airlines. And there's also the topic of customer experience. So what's all about, we're going to hear from our experts, Tim and John, and uh, we're going to start with the first topic, the airline payments ecosystem. So Tim will explain us a little bit about this process. And let's start with a short question, um, Tim. The, Payment cards like credit cards are around since many years. But I or we in general experience that people are through the last years talking a lot about digitalized payments, so online payments. And I wonder whether there was a trigger for this. Yes, so um, looking back, uh, not at the current pandemic, but looking back to 2003, um, the SARS pandemic was basically uh, the reason why online payments and e-commerce really um, uh, fueled uh, in the Asian market. And I just took here for an example Alipay. It was uh, f founded right in the pandemic back then as the Chinese lockdown um, created the issue that um, the people in China really wanted to have an alternative to point of sale payments uh, or have yeah, basically a contactless option. You know. What's quite interesting uh, how they grew now in, in the last years. Well, Tim, how big is Alipay right now? It's quite interesting. Um, they have about uh, four times uh, more active users than PayPal, which is, uh, of course, um, more popular here in, in, in Europe and uh, the US. Uh, and actually they have about 20 times the transaction volume. Uh, most of that is uh, originated in uh, Asia and China in specific. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing to see how, how um, they grew in the last uh, years. Uh, also talking about JD.com, uh, which was also launched back then in the last pandemic uh, as, the, as an e-commerce platform. And um, yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. They had now at the singles day this year, November 11, uh, they had 41 billion US dollars um, in uh, revenues just on that one day. And yeah, quite amazing to see they were also born during the pandemic in 2003. If we continue now to uh, the current pandemic, we see similar uh, behavior. So at the peak uh, around uh, March, April, um, we saw in the US e-commerce uh, increased 50% so April compared to March. I saw the same uh, behavior in, in Europe, of course. Uh, I just got here the figures from the UK. Um, they uh, so went up 65%. And also, again, if you look at Asia, at the, really at the peak of the pandemic um, in China, um, household goods uh, were they quadrupled uh, during uh, the peak. Yeah? So now, of course, the uh, curve has flattened a lot, especially in China. So this reduced again, but really at the peak times, uh, yeah, we saw lots of uh, online sales. Uh, if we take a look at these um, um, industries where online sales decreased a lot, um, I brought along some, some typical examples here. So especially sports clubs, um, membership clubs, so your, your local gym and so on. Uh, they had a huge decrease because they were heavily affected, of course, by the lockdown. Um, shoe stores decreased. And on the lower right, uh, this is basically our industry. So travel agencies, tour operators, airlines and so on. They had the biggest impact, of course. They were impacted by the lockdowns really heavily, uh, up to 90% decrease at the peak of the uh, pandemic. Okay, Tim, now we have learned about the trigger and the explosive growth of online payments. 
Uh, but how about the evolution of payment service providers, also known as PSPs, and payment gateways? It seems to be something very particular. Yes, um, so if we go also back again a couple of years uh, in the early days of uh, e-commerce in the airline industry, you would most likely have a setup uh, like this. Um, so you had two or three sales channels, think of your airline.com, maybe an agent.com website, and uh, you already had a couple of acquirers here to handle Visa, MasterCard, and maybe uh, Amex uh, directly but also already some alternative uh, payment methods, the so-called AMOPs, uh, something like uh, PayPal, for example. Yeah. What you already see here uh, is a kind of a scaling problem. So we have, in this example, five APIs to manage, integrate new versions, and um, all of those three uh, sales channels. So basically, the um, the issue already came uh, apparent. Uh, you had to integrate those. You, had, um, you needed lots of time uh, uh, to, to keep track and uh, maintain to new versions of these APIs. And uh, yeah, we're already kind of slow to adapt new payment methods, which uh, yeah, popped up uh, globally. OK. Um... Tim, the airlines are maybe something special in this payment process because they sell the tickets in many different countries and in every country you have different payment methods. So they probably have to connect their website to many, many different payment systems or payment service providers. How do the airlines solve this scaling problem? Yeah, so this is now basically a few years later, those payment service providers came into the picture. So the idea was there already to consolidate um, those connections, uh, reduce the integration efforts uh, within these airline sales channels, and yeah, to kind of fasten up the, the adaption to new payment uh, types. But of course, uh, yeah, this also uh, created some complexities and um, additional fees. Uh, and how can the airline stay flexible and independent of specific PSPs? Is there a solution for this? Yes, so um, like in this picture, you, you might have thought about um, already integrating maybe two PSPs, so to stay independent uh, from them. Um, you might have taken this approach also to, um, due to historic reasons, yes, so maybe you have two airlines which merge and so on. And yeah, as you managed, as you said, um, they now had to manage multiple PSPs um, and maybe some direct connections to the acquirers. And what we basically then saw um, is a move toward uh, an airline payment gateway. So this could be developed in-house uh, by the airline themselves or uh, one of those um, airline IT providers could uh, provide one of this one. And um, yeah, and if you basically take a look at this picture now, so this is maybe today's world, you have even more uh, sales channels. Um, so if you think about NDC, uh, NDC one order, so maybe um, even yeah, growing numbers of direct sales channels. And using such a gateway um, helps you to, to modernize um, uh, your setup here, uh, reduce the complexity to uh, integrate those different payment methods and uh, PSPs. And what we also see is um, that using the airline itinerary data actually helps you. Yeah, yeah. So it might be the case that your PSP is not really focused too much using the airline data during the payment, but um, if, if you have such a gateway, you could. So by saying that, I mean something like um, using the uh, airline data for um, a fraud check or deciding whether to do 3D secure uh, authentication. You know? So one simple example would be um, to determine the origin and destination of the flight and um, check whether uh, either one of these two countries are matching uh, the country where the credit card was issued 
So these kind of things um, really need the airline data during the payment process. And besides this consolidation aspect, this is the second aspect, um, which uh, where those payment gateways really can help. Well, I think that this kind of payment gateway is a very smart solution of airlines or for airlines. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about other challenges within online payments for airlines? What do airlines expect? What do they want? Yeah, actually, I think that's a good chance to, to take a poll um, and get our audience involved. Um, so, uh, yeah, we would like to know from you um, what are the top uh, payment priorities in your organization. Um, so the answers we have are uh, either maintaining the same payment technology or is it accepting more payments internationally or is it modernizing your payment system in terms of uh, going into the direction, let's say like a, a airline payment gateway or is it uh, increasing the number of uh, local payment methods or payment methods in uh, general. So let's take some uh, let's say 30 seconds to vote here. Okay. So we see some votes coming in. Okay, what about five more seconds? Five. Four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's take a look at the result. Uh, maintaining payment technologies about one fifth. Now it's only 10% of the votes, 67% uh, modernizing the payment system, and 22% uh, increasing the number of payment methods. And um, this is actually um, what the ATPS conference, the airline travel payment. Summit um, also asked their uh, participants uh, just recently um, in October. Uh, the, basically, the same question was asked. And if we take a look at their results, it's uh, more or less matching what we just had here. Um, so, uh, there was a strong focus on modernizing payment systems and accepting those um, local payment methods more and more. So um, let's actually take a look at this topic, local payment methods. Mm -hmm. I have an example here um, from one PSP, um, also with current figures now from January to June this year. And um, this is takes some time to, to understand the slide, but it's quite interesting. So if you take a look at those payment methods uh, on the left, these ones are really local payment methods. Yeah. So IDEA is um, popular in the Netherlands, uh, Bank Contact is uh, popular in, in Belgium, so for Überweisung is a typical German uh, online payment method. And I also brought along an example from uh, Poland, uh, Blick, PayU, and so on. So if you would be a merchant, or let's say a domestic airline just in these markets, you would need them. Yeah. And what we see now is that even if you are a merchant outside these home markets of these payment methods, uh, there was a big growth in, in the last months. Yeah. So, for example, IDEA in uh, Cyprus and Ireland, they saw growth rates of 200 to 300%. Uh, bank contact in Germany, 50% growth, even though it's originating in Belgium. And yeah, also 200% increase in the Netherlands for. Uh, the Polish ones, yeah. and I forgot the uh, the Portugal on the German one. Uh, they also saw an increase in France of about sixty percent. Yeah, so quite interesting to see here the growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How relevant is this for airlines, Tim? Yeah, I think it's uh, especially relevant for airlines, um, uh, unless you are just uh, yeah, flying uh, within a domestic market. But um, as long as you uh, offer flights internationally. And you um, want to reach uh, broader uh, or offer a broader set of payment methods to reach your customers. Um, I think, especially for airlines, this uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
Okay, I think there are some some new requirements coming up, especially for online payments. And uh, I named one of it is 3DS. So 3DS2 will can become compulsory for online payments by the end of the year in, in Europe. How does it affect airlines? Yeah, exactly. You're right. Um, it's becoming mandatory um, end of this year. There are some countries who extended the deadline a few more months, but let's say in general, it will become mandatory on, on January 1st. So uh, let's start first. What, what is 3D Secure? Um, 3D Secure is the secure authentication of your credit card. And this means um, doing an additional step, so like multi-factor authentication to prove that you are really the uh, card holder of the credit card. Uh, so what does that mean in detail? If you take a look at the left picture, this is a typical setup if you do not do 3D secure. So at the time of the payment, um, basically the, the acquirer or the payment service provider has to decide, is he going to accept that payment? Yeah, so does he really trust that the card holder is um, booking this ticket or uh, could it be fraud? Was the card stolen or hacked? Yeah. So, uh, of course, I can determine it on, on based on some data, but um, there's, uh, yeah, there's, of course, um, lots of options for risk of fraud. Now, with 3D Secure, um, if you take a look at the right um, picture, um, they basically are able to um, take a closer look on those cases in between. Yeah, so by saying in between, I mean those cases where it's not clear. Is it fraud or is it uh, no fraud? And the 3D Secure Standard allows you um, to send your customer into a challenge flow. So that means um, his um, bank um, app will pop up on his smartphone and he has to authenticate with his fingerprint or face ID or maybe a one-time token is sent to his phone, which he then has to enter. And now the um, interesting part here is, on the one hand, um, 3D Secure declines uh, are allowed. Yeah? So you don't have those payment declines anymore where it's not fraud. And on the other hand, fraud is reduced. And the 3DS2 standard, especially, which is the new version, uh, there was already a 3DS1 standard uh, available in the last year. Yes, uh, the 3DS2 standard um, has a big benefit. Um, it is frictionless. Um, in most cases, it's mobile ready. Uh, so the first standard was not really mobile ready. Um, it definitely lowers the abandonment rates. So with the old standard, usually you were just redirected to your bank's website and asked to enter a password. Most customers didn't know their password and so on, and then basically just abandoned the um, ticket purchase. So it's really a good solution and uh, more and more airlines adapting to it and yeah, trying to reach now um, the deadline end of the year. Okay, so um, already summing up here, um, looking at those various topics, uh, what do we see the, the benefits and the challenges uh, within the airline uh, payment ecosystems? Uh, benefits, I, I mean, uh, using an um, airline payment gateway to um, solve these challenges. So main parts are managing and consolidating um, payments and those different uh, PSPs and acquirers, um, reducing time and effort, which is spent on the integration um, for those various direct sales to connect to those payment methods. Uh, airline addendum data, which I mentioned, um, so we're really using the uh, data such as origin, destination, point of sale, and so on, uh, during the payment process to decide um, whether to do a forecheck or not. Uh, also reduce some fees, um, uh, which have to, which can be reduced at the acquirers um, if you provide this data to them. And last but not least, of course, PCI compliance. Um, so the credit card security standard is always a topic um, where also those payment gateways can help you the effort. 
Okay, Tim, thank you very much for this introduction into the world of online payments. This looks uh, for myself a little bit complex, but uh, quite smooth process, how it's organized. Um, what I'm missing a little bit are the, the pain points in this process, especially the pain points for the merchant. And um, to talk about this, we will come to Jean, who can explain us a little bit about fraud, chargeback, refunds, and all these hazards which merchants or airlines may face. So, John, I will switch to the next slide and um, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me walk you through the payment uh, challenges airline merchants uh, have generally faced the past two to four years, according to our observation and investigation by the aviation industry. However, the presence of multiple um, payment methods, new series channels, country-specific uh, ru uh, payment rules, acquira processes, dynamic currencies and lack of transparency of bank files make payment control management complex and resource intensive task for the airlines. If this complexity is not controlled and um, reconciled at the uh, transactional level, let's say, the airline are exposed to potential loss of revenue. Let's look at the figures here, the pain points and the, the main problem the airline are facing. We have investigated uh, on the market and I work with some companies um, to figure out where are exactly the pain point for the airlines. Um, if you see here, we have a fraud losses in, two, in the two, 2018 is by 28 billion projected and uh, it's going to grow in five years by 36 billion. So globally of global, globally revenue reached by 1.9 trillion in 2018, reflecting 6% growth. This means if you see this revenue and the volume of, of, of fraud is, 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 is a huge, it's a high volume of, uh, of uh, pain that the, uh, the market payment merchant markets are facing with the credit card payment. So we have, uh, we spend the time to make some uh, uh, study case with one of uh, uh, airline based here in Europe. We, we pick up 1 million bookings. Out of this 1 million, we perform some um, analysis. We found out 100,000 mismatches. Those mismatches, not only tickets or payment errors, and there's, those include also mileage, points, uh, whatever, even layover voucher, all this is a, a loss of revenue for the airline. If you see out of those 100,000 mismatches, there is a 1,000 which remain unsolved. This is a loss of money and the airline just keep it. So if we go to the uh, revenue side, reconciliation, what is this? It's not just to... Um, you know, to take a payment data, take transaction, and then take bank file to say, okay, I make a reconciliation. It's deeper than this because there is, a, you know, there is a chargeback involved, there's a, uh, a refund involved, there's other mix match, mismatch payment involved, all this. And uh, there is, a, uh, we should, the airline should, uh, you know, look at deeper in this, address those questions. To the uh, to the market, how this problem can com commonly solved. Okay, John, this looks like a very big number. So if I see the twenty-eight billion, oh my God, this is for the airline industry very very uh, big money. And um, I think reconciliation is really necessary. But before we come to the next slide, um, just a short explanation because you were using two terms. This is uh, refund and chargeback. What does it mean and what is the difference between refund and chargeback? So refund is, is just, um, you know, um, the meaning of a refund, a short description is just you buy something, you purchase something, 
can be service, can be ticket, can be product you are not using, or the product is damaged, or the, the seller cannot deliver the service. You, you go to him, you, want, you return the product, you want your money. However, so this is a one-to-one -one, um, uh, contract between two, uh, two uh, persons. And um, on the other hand, we have the chargeback where the, there is a third party involved in this. This is acquiring bank saying, okay, I am the one who, who, who issued the, the credit card. So the passenger just go to his issuing bank, say the service not provided, I want my money back. And the acquiring bank just refund the, the just get, get, uh, give the money to the passenger. And on the top of this, they will charge the airline on the chargeback fee. So the airline is here somehow, uh, it's a dilemma for the airline here because the, the money is revert to, to the passenger, the service is not provided, it's okay, but the acquirer is not doing this job for free. Yeah, they charge the airline on this. So um, in the pandemic time now, this volume of a refund is, uh, is, is, is highly increased. So normally to perform a refund, there is a refund rules which have to be respected. Due to pandemic, there is no, there's no time, there's no, there's no manpower to, uh, to control the, the refund uh, rules if those refunds are, you know, are reasonable or not reasonable. Therefore, uh, the airline are facing a huge uh, problem here with a refund uh, um, uh, re request. Mm. And can a refund and chargeback happen at the same time that maybe somebody's waiting for the refund, it doesn't come in time, so he's thinking about a chargeback via his credit card company? Is this possible that it happens? Yeah, please go to the next slide and then... Uh... So, yes, refund and chargeback can uh, happen. Um, unfortunately, yes, this happened because the, um, you know, uh, the passenger doesn't care. He wants, his goal is to get the money back. So he requests the refund by the airline. The airline, let's say two, two to uh, two weeks, no response because they have a bunch of refund to, to work on. At the same time, the passenger requests for the chargeback at the, uh, uh, by, by his bank. And there is a, a lack of communication. So the bank, there is a, a timeline rules that's the um, set by um, by the European government for for the European Union, for example, for a chargeback, the the Aquera has a, a four to seven day to revert the money to the passenger. So at that time, the Aquera, of course, send an email to the airline to request for additional information if the uh, the chargeback is reasonable or not reasonable. So based on that, um, if this request from the Aquera not timely provided and then the Aquera is forced to revert the money to the uh, to the um, yeah to the passenger at the same time three weeks later the the service uh, the the refund request is uh, is uh, processed by the airline uh, and then they will reverse this money also there is you know there is a lack of time of communication so this can lead to the uh, double usage or uh, does refund uh, usage of the document. Uh, so, well, we, we said in the beginning that we wanted to address the questions from the audience at the end of the presentation, but here I got one which is particularly interesting exactly at that point because it's regarding Corona, COVID-19. Um, John, do you know what were the payment chargeback peaks for airlines during the pandemic crisis? Yeah, I have um, um, run some investigation on the market with one of the um, um, famous, um, one of the biggest company in uh, in chargeback area and the fraud area. So, for example, uh, CB911 based in the US. And um, I work with them uh, several times to just to, to see on the market where are the pain points in regard of a fraud and uh, uh, chargeback. So the result, you can see it here. We have, for example, uh, um, you know, um, we have preventable chargebacks, which is uh, can come from uh, 
criminal uh, activities. Yeah, so uh, your credit card is stolen, or there is a, a, um, a lot of um, yeah cyber criminal uh, uh, criminals, and they do they did something. Those one you can see it here in red, and this is uh, smoothly increasing. Yeah, from 2012, and uh, now we are from one to uh, to 10 percent. But you know, even it's why the market is forced now to to introduce the 3DS to the market to avoid those criminal um, uh, frauds. But this doesn't mean that the, the chargeback will reduce because there is another form of chargeback, which is, uh, we call it uh, friendly chargeback or merchant errors. Friendly chargeback, you can see it here. We have um, uh, up to six to 80%, which is a blue, and the passenger bought, uh, uh, bought something, doesn't recognize that uh, 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 if he received the invoice from the Aquera, he doesn't recognize that's, that was his article. So all this, there is a friendly fraud which uh, leads really, really, really to a pain for the airlines. And it's a very difficult to control this. And because you need the manpower to investigate, you don't have the expertise. And uh, therefore, my, my recommendation here is quite simple. There is uh, several tools, several companies, chargeback companies, just address this problem to them. They will support you, however, because you need uh, to really understand the process of the chargeback in general. So, on the other hand, we have here the merchant errors, which is also uh, slightly increasing the gray one. We have a 20 to 40 percent merchant errors which is the error of uh, merchant setup, transaction data is, uh, is uh, corrupt, or other processing account for more than 20 to uh, 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 leak and lead to chargeback because the, the information is not properly addressed to the Aquera. All this can lead uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to chargeback and to big uh, pain for the airline, loss of revenue of the airline. Mm -hmm. Well, we now learned that the volume of fraud has increased incredibly during COVID-19, but um, I wonder whether there are additional challenges for airline like in, like in normal times if there is no COVID-19. Yeah. Um, there is another challenge, of course, for the airline. The biggest one, we call it collateral agreements. Yeah, collateral agreements. Collateral agreements. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, in the payment world, yeah, it's called cash security reserve. This means that the airline is um, is monitor weekly for its cash flow risk by its acquiring bank. Yeah, they monitor every week how many uh, money cash flow the airline has. Yeah, every week. The acquira monitors the airline finance statement and calculate the risk based on the transactions. Yeah, it's mainly the date and plus three days. And uh, this means that they keep, the Aquera keep up to 60% of all unflown ticket sales in the event that's um, in the event and the guarantee that the airline does not fly for, for certain reasons such as a flight defects or cancellation claims, etc. So in order to cover the chargeback costs addressed by passengers, so this means the airline saw something, the flight is $100,000, the Aquara keep of them 60% of the sales of the day to say, okay, if you, you are not flying yet, so I keep the money. Um, so this is also a pain. If you need the money then, you need a cash flow to pay your employees or your, your invoices, yeah, partners. So you have to request to the acquirer to say, I need more money. So it's like a, a dilemma for the airline. So they are forced to take the acquirer. And this is also in this pandemic time lead to a huge cash flow issues for the airlines. Yeah. So this is also something uh, on for my the, the main, the main, the, the, the most airlines, let's say airline that's change is why they, some airlines they are forced to change aquarius so airlines that change aquara in the last three to four years yeah has a contract with collateral requirement 
Yeah, this is a statement. This is, uh, this is also, if you change, you can negotiate the new deals and so on to reduce the collateral um, um, uh, value and the risk. Okay, are there other possibilities an airline can do to reduce the cost or to uh, speed up the process? Yes, what we recommend uh, to the airlines is, um, um, you know, to, um, to step back, to investigate in the, in the current processes, to optimize the current payment processes. You know, there is a department like a refund, there is a chargeback department, there is a treasury. They don't talk to each other. They have to reduce the communication flow. Yeah, talk to experts, yeah, to, for example, charge by company, make an, an, a new deals to reduce all those costs. Well, interesting. And I bet that we can talk about these processes. Tim has explained and Yu Jean has just explained for the next two, three hours. But unfortunately, we only have um, 60 minutes and we also got some questions from the audience in between. And um, actually, I don't want to let the audience wait. So Tim, John, thank you very much for this introduction. This was um, extremely interesting. And I think highlights a process which is for the outside world quite quite complex, also to me. Um, uh, what I see now uh, is a question concerning the data itself. So in the digitalized economy, this is one question from the audience. In the digitalized economy, data is the oil of this digitalized economy, of the, of the new world. Um, and during the payment process, the airlines and also the payment provider, especially the payment provider, receive lots of data and um, about the itinerary, about the payment, about refunds. What are they going to do? And are the airlines also beneficiaries of the data? Do they receive a feedback from the payment service provider about this? Tim, hello, Jean. Yeah, so um, of course, if you if you have your own uh, airline payment gateway, uh, you would have the data on, on your hands, right? Or if you use one of those um, from the airline IT providers. Um, with the, let's say, regular piece, piece, it kind of depends. So for, for some of them, you have the option to uh, dig deeper and also this airline itinerary data. For some of them, uh, not. But I mean, usually, you have the data um, if you control the shopping process before the payment. Yeah? So maybe you don't have a full picture, but um, yeah, getting quite close to it. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe a question to Tim. Uh, Jean has explained a lot about fraud and chargebacks and so on. And here we got a very different question from the audience also about security and safety. Many years ago, there was a big fraud on the British Airways website, which could happen to any airline uh, out in the world. And uh, how safe is the interface or the connection between the airline website and the payment service provider or the payment gateway? Yeah, I think in, in this specific case, if I remember correctly, um, um, was not the, the problem was not originated at, at BA themselves, but at some external third party where they um, integrated some JavaScript. And I would assume, not knowing the details, but I would assume they had their own uh, file integrity monitoring at uh, British Airways to detect um, any manipulation of their binaries and configs, but um, most likely did not cover the, um, the third party. But this is just now yeah, taking assumptions. So um, let's put it uh, more general. So what, 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 what I would recommend is to make sure that your file integrity monitoring covers everything, yeah? not your own config and binaries, um, but also if you use external uh, uh, JavaScript and so on, um, also cover them, monitor your website from the outside, run a, run a job every five minutes, compare the compare a hash a value of your website to what you would expect. Yeah, and raise an alarm if it doesn't match. Hmm. 
This looks like a lot of work. And Tim, do you know who's, who's doing this? Did uh, airlines build up a new IT department that cares about online payments, or do they outsource this task? And um, the airlines doing it, what do you recommend? Or if the airlines are dealing with service companies, what do you recommend? What's the best for the airlines? Uh, sorry, what do you mean like uh, recommend in terms of uh, integrating PSPs or? Um, yeah, um, you know, there are the fields on the payment page when I purchase a ticket and where I enter the payment card credentials. And I think what I understand, this is a weak point in this process and setting up all this and the interface to payment service providers, payment gateways, who's, who's doing it? Yes, uh, there are different options. Yes, so usually PSPs offer uh, such a payment page. So uh, of course, um, they should be PCI compliant, and this means um, taking care of all those security requirements uh, that this page is not manipulated. Um, if you do it on your own, um, so I mean, if, if the airline does it on their own, they have to become that there's PCI compliant. So set up all those security measures to make sure that uh, uh, the payment page is integrated correctly, cannot be tampered with, and so on. Mm -hmm. We yeah, got a question probably to Jean, because it's about chargeback mm -hmm. and um, the reconciliation about chargeback. I've heard uh, that there are airlines who don't care about chargeback and that just pay for it, accept the chargeback. And I say it's too much hassle to um, check on chargeback whether uh, they're valid or whether the claim is not valid. Um, what do you think, John? This is this uh, important to take care of chargeback or can you just let it go? No, uh, because it's a loss of revenue. Yeah, chargeback, you cannot just let them go. I know that what we, we uh, face um, during our investigation that the airlines, the they just say, oh, no, we don't have uh, chargeback. We have only 0.2 or 0.1% of chargeback without really controlling, checking up what the um, um, really the value is. Because um, chargeback is not, uh, because if you, the, the airline, that is a portal, the Aquera informed the airline, that is, okay, chargeback has been done. So if you claim, if you claim the charge, the, the, you request back to the Aquera, it's a, it's a cost for the airline because they charge you more, the, the uh, Aquera to investigate on your request. So therefore the airlines, they are saying it's easier than for no react and then it's done. But at the end of the day, if you consolidate all those values, it's a high. Yeah, they don't recognize. If you don't investigate, you see we don't have it. So therefore, my recommendation is to take um, experts to to do this tax for you because you need a chargeback. It's a very very complicated issue. You need expert company people working now has experience in it to support you um, to apply the appropriate tools equipment. To, uh, to cover your chargeback uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, here we got another question for Tim. Tim, you have explained quite uh, detailed the issue with uh, 3DS, 3DS2. And um, one of the one out of the audience, he wants to, he or she wants to know about the deadlines for the implementation of uh, 3DS, 3DS2. Yeah, so the deadline is uh, end of the year uh, in, in most European countries. Um, if you want to dig a bit deeper, so if you uh, want to know the difference between 3DS1 and 2 deadlines, so it doesn't matter, you could do either one of them to, to become PSD2 2 compliant, but as I mentioned, 3DS2 is much more uh, frictionless mobile ready. And um, looking ahead in 2021 and 22, what's especially uh, interesting here to be considered when uh, integrating 3DS is that already end of this year, um, MasterCard will, I think, double uh, the scheme fees for, for most European countries if you use 3DS1. Uh, so a reason to go right away for 3DS2. 
Um, Visa is, I think, stopping the um, yeah the application of liability shift for 3DS1 uh, end of uh, 2021. Uh, Mastercard um, will depreciate 3DS1 um, in, in 2022, and I think Visa didn't mention the exact date yet, and they will uh, stop 3DS1. So there is a clear recommendation go for 3DS2. It's not only much more customer friendly, but uh, you can already see that the old standard will be depreciated in the uh, next years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um... While we talk about this process and implementation or introduction of new processes, there is one question regarding NEC one order, which will add maybe new complexity to the payment process. So Jean Tim, what do you think about NDC one order? Does it change the way the payment world for airlines? If you um, maybe Tim, let me take this question. Um, NDC one order. So that is, we are we we are now doing the NDC one order. I suppose now because due to the pandemic, there is a slowdown and so on. We of course uh, are working intensively on a solution for that. You know, payment is payment. If it's one order or NDC, you use your credit card to pay something. Yeah, and um, that is uh, in that way. There is uh, two directions. Uh, if you are an airline, there is a possibility to go via uh, to do the, your settlement via IATA clearinghouse. There is a they call it um, a settlement with order, and there is a specific process defined for that. You can go to that way, but uh, uh, nonetheless, you have to uh, control also your sales through your own uh, offer management system. Yeah. So this is uh, you get the payment there, which is uh, you, you you need still need a, an agreement with the with Aquera. So, um, on my point of view, there is no big change, but we have another channel, sales channel, yeah, to the what we have today. It's one addition more. So therefore, uh, on the reconciliation side or fraud side, the chargeback side, the issue is still the same. And of, of my point of view at this uh, stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. And here we got another question from the audience, which is a little bit longer. So sorry, I need to read this question first. And I think it's about um, a topic Jean has talked about. Uh, the question is about um, passengers going to buy a ticket for himself and for his uh, partner, and he pays this ticket with his own credit card. And then they come to the counter and then they have to pay for like an upgrade or an oversized luggage. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the partner is paying with her own credit card uh, this additional fee. So if you want to have or want to make a reconciliation now because the flight has, can has been canceled, um, how you do it? How you get the both together? Is this possible? Yeah, this is a very, uh, very good question, a tricky question. Um, yes, um, it's possible because what uh, what is possible is uh, depending at, at which level you you do your orchestration of the data. So let's say you do your um, you know your reconciliation on ticket level or on a PNR level and so on on a passenger name level. There is a, a different, uh, let's say. Um, characteristic how you want to which algorithm you want to apply for your reconciliation so this means if you if the the family are flying or they have a excess baggage or they pay for three and one is left or whatever um, at that time you have uh, your pnr if you have a system yeah using a pnr for reconciliation at the first time all those things are uh, assigned to one single PNR. Under this PNR, there is a one credit card payment. So there is a possibility to say, the, let's say it's a family, the, the, the man, the husband paid the ticket online and at the airport, uh, the wife, his wife paid the excess baggage with her own credit card. Of course, we have a different credit card in one, uh, one uh, PNR. So 
what's there is a system there is a possibility to say okay assign all purchase additional purchases at the airport different from the um, uh, from the pnr summarize all this in one single uh, collect this all all this in one single transaction this can be, there is a system this can be done we can support on this also i have to say directly and uh, this the possibilities is there yeah and this can also reduce some uh, uh, mismatches this is those are the uh, finding we we detected during our observation and our investigation and those one is uh, is a possible but it's a, it's a tricky ones yeah but it's a possible can be solved mm -hmm. Okay, so questions are still coming in, and um, we are almost like uh, 55 minutes. So I suggest I will pick one last question, and uh, possibly it's a question to Tim because it's about PCI. And the question is how do you integrate PCI DSS compliance in a modern DevSecOps process in an agile team? So it's a little bit apart from the payment process itself, but since we talked about the teams so who implement like a payment process, it could be interesting as well. Tim. Yeah, and I think I could talk another 55 minutes about that. Um, so yeah, just in a nutshell, um, uh, yeah, it is a kind of a challenge, but uh, there are the tools, yeah. So if you have an agile development team um, and have your CI, CD pipeline up and running, um, most of these tools um, have some plugins to, to help you with uh, security code reviews, is automatically um, checking for vulnerabilities within your solution. Um, file monitoring already talked about, um, even for pen testing, which is still done heavily manually, and also, I, to my opinion, needs to be done always manually, but can be supported now also automatically. So there are tools like the uh, Verb Suite or the um, OverZap, um, which can be integrated in. CI/CD pipeline. If you develop your own payment solution and want to get PCI compliant. Okay, thank you, Tim. And um, I surely have the impression we could talk about another hour or two about this topic, even only about PCI-related topics. Unfortunately, we are almost at the end of um, our session of our online conference and what's left to me is to thank you john and tim for this brilliant explanation of this complex process and i hope it was very interesting for the audience so thanks a lot uh, to everybody who joins the session today but before we finish i'd like to hand over to lila because she has some ending words and she also got the contacts where you can reach out to our experts and reach out to the systems to see the recording of this presentation. So thank you very much. Have a good day. And Lila, please, for the ending words. Thanks, Christian. So, I mean, you guys had some really good questions that can be continued on, or if you have interest into reaching out to one of the sales colleagues uh, or, 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 or our experts, um, here's their contact information. Feel free to take a screenshot or scan the Q&A code uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, before I close this uh, online conference, I'd like to share or just kind of remind you again that this uh, Skype call is being recorded and that you can find it on the Lufthansa Systems website. And while you're there, I would recommend that you check into these other topics that we've recorded throughout the year. And then also, our next conference will be taking place on January 28th, 2021, where we will focus on the future of aviation. And in this particular conference, we will share the insights and ideas on how to divide and secure the new urban airspace. And from what I understand, this conference has really strong speakers um, I think they're from NASA, uh, the Air Force, Boeing, just to name a few. But again, I encourage you to go to the Lufthansa Systems website to um, check into that some more. And stay tuned for uh, more to come in 2021. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining on behalf of Lufthansa Systems. 
stay healthy, keep well, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.